You're listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast, with service members from across the military, sharing their stories of combat and survival. And now, here's your host, Mark Zeno. Welcome into the Hazard Ground Podcast. As always, we appreciate you joining us each and every week. As always, a few notes before we get started with this week's episode. As we've been telling you the past couple of weeks, if you have written us and haven't received a response back, be sure to check your spam folder. We take the time to write everybody back who took the time to write us. So please check your spam folder to make sure our response didn't get placed there as opposed to your regular email. And if you still don't see it, please shoot us a note again and we'll certainly take the time to respond back to you. Go to our website, hazardground.com. Check out our sponsors tab. All of our sponsors are there. Please support our affiliate sponsors. They're a big part of why this Hazard Ground podcast is such a success. And if you support them, you're supporting us. So check out our website, hazardground.com and the sponsors tab. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Let's get to 2,000 subscribers. We're really happy with how you guys are helping us grow through social media, not only on YouTube, but also Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. So follow us on all those sites, and really, let's continue to grow this Hazard Ground community. Finally, our promotion with Amazon. You know the deal. On our website, hazardground.com, under that same Sponsors tab, or at the bottom of the homepage, just click on the Amazon button. It'll take you straight to amazon.com. Do all of your normal shopping. We'll get a percentage of what you guys spend, and we'll kick it right back to some of the great charities and organizations that have been featured here on the Hazard Ground podcast. So you can help out veterans across the country just by going to hazardground.com first. All that out of the way, let's get on to this week's episode. Joining us this week on the Hazard Ground podcast is a retired corporal from the United States Army who had two deployments to Iraq with the 3rd Infantry Division. He was wounded there and awarded a Purple Heart. After transitioning out of the military, he went on to become a police officer with the New York City Police Department, eventually earning the rank of detective where he is currently a forensic sketch artist for the NYPD. He is Matthew Klein joining us on the Hazard Ground Podcast. Matthew, welcome, brother. Good to talk to you. Thank you so much for having me on. Okay, very interesting. First sketch artist I've ever talked to in life, um, <laughs> let alone one that uh, at one point uh, you know, went from holding a gun to now holding a pencil. So, um, and it's interesting because you know, sketch artist uh, is sort of something that is, is a dying breed around you know, police forces in general. Like When you think about what we can do with computers and everything else and how we can generate pictures and so on and so forth, people who have to do those drawings with their hands are kind of rare, aren't they? Yeah, you know, it's, you know, because technology is uh, a lot of cam- everything's on camera now and video and stuff. It's definitely, it's definitely come down the workload and um, there's definitely less and less of us. In, in the entire country, there's about 100 wow. uh, sketch artists and um, there's three, uh, NYPD has three, which is pretty wild. But, but still, the reason why there's still a need for us is because technology fails, cameras aren't on things don't work or the, or they get video that's crappy or fuzzy. So then they, they call us in to fill in the blanks and help the detectives on the ground to you know solve different cases. Gotcha. Well, let me just get this out there at the beginning before we get to your personal story. Um, you those sketch it. artists, those sketches that you guys do, they give me yep. PTSD because remember the show <laughs> uh, Unsolved Mysteries with Robert yeah, Stack? Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> they always put that sketch up there. I was like seven or eight or nine years old watching that. My parents watched and I was just, and they put that picture up and it would scare the ever living crap out of me that I would see that dude around. So whenever I see those sketches, I, I kind of get into to hot sweats from, from looking at what you guys do. Drawings are great, but it kind of just <laughs> freaks me out a little bit. Anyway, total aside. Okay, let's get back to you. So uh, a kid growing up in, in New York out on Long Island. Hey, we're, we're, we're brothers like that. Uh, I'm originally yeah. from Long Island as well. Uh, how did you end up and why did you end up in the military? Well, um, like growing up as a kid, my grandfather was a World War II veteran. He was Same a, for uh, me. <laughs> It's all, he was a dive bomber pilot in the um, in the Pacific on the U.S. Ticonderoga. So wow. he was at Guadalcanal. He was at Iwo Jima. And um, he was like growing – even like now, I wish I would have got more stories out of him. But he used to just be vividly tell me stories about you know different operations they would do. Like they, they'd be in Gu- uh, Guadalcanal and the Marines would be like – Top, uh, targets. We have no targets for you today. Targets of opportunity. Bomb anything above these, you know, lines and stuff. And like, just like the stories of him going in, strafing, you know, jungle trees and Japanese Taiko tanks and stuff. And like, just all different stories. I just like really had that that military background of just like wanting to serve my country. And it was him and his brother. So Pearl Harbor got you know got bombed, and him and his brother they both signed up. And um, his he went into the Pacific, and then his brother went into um. Europe and was in the uh, a B-17, a navigator. He ended up getting shot down and killed over Germany. So like growing up with that, I always had that, you know, 
that hoorah freaking just want to get in and you know you know just that you know watching all the war movies and stuff so later on that played a part when 9-11 happened you know i felt like that was my pearl harbor gotcha where were you on 9-11 I was I was just working. I was uh, I was doing like retail out in the out in the outlet store, and you know, and I heard it on the radio, and uh, you heard the first plane. You know, you just heard it on the radio. I thought it was like a small like you know Cessna or something, and then the second plane. You know, they said over the radio on the way to work. It's definitely terrorism, and you know, just everything unfolded after that. Yeah, and, and you know, I'll pause here for a moment for those uh, who aren't New Yorkers. Um, this is a very personal, visceral. Uh, sort of thing for people who are from New York. Um, you know, I, I remember that day vividly. Uh, and what I remember more than anything is, is I wasn't in New York on the day, but I remember hustling to try and get a hold of everybody in New York. I had, you know, half a dozen friends on Wall Street. My brother was a union guy working in the city. You know, I had friends who worked all over New York. And as I said, you know, it's where I grew up. So everybody who was everybody that I knew was in Manhattan on that day, uh, and and sort of the fear and the freaking out and trying to figure out where everybody was, and of course, cell phones in New York did not work that day. Back in the day, remember, if the cell phone tower got <laughs> logged, it would just go do 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 do, and it would automatically hang up because you couldn't, you know, you couldn't get through, and and you were trying relentlessly to find people. And then, you know, as uh, my my stepfather was a cop, and you know, he had to run into New York City, and my brother had to walk home across the Brooklyn Bridge, and there were tanks rolling down the LIE. I mean, it was. You know, to, to to be in New York that day or be from New York, um, it, it's just a 9-11 is, is a different level of personal to you. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, it it, it like really, it, it, you know, that was my generation, Pearl Harbor, you know, like mm -hmm. I just felt the calling like, oh, it's time to go, you know, like that's it, you know, and I was, you know, I was an able-bodied guy and I had nothing going on, you know, like nothing really going on. I'm like, you know, it's my, I, I felt it was my calling to go over there and serve, you know, go, go fight the fight that needs to be fought. What, and, um, what did your family say? They were like, they were kind of like, Ugh, you know, and I wanted to do infantry and they were all like, Oh, why, you know, like why I got to do infantry. And I'm like, Oh, this is what, you know, like, I just want to get over there, you know, as fast as I could. So, but you know, in the end they were all supportive and that, you know, some of the best decisions I ever made in my life, you know? All right. So, um, what happens next? Like, I mean, how quickly do you get to a recruiting station, get enlisted, get off the basic? Oh, it was pretty, it was pretty quickly. They were taking everybody. So I, you know, I went to Fort Benning and did the one-stop training. I'm, I'm curious then, though. I'm sorry to interrupt Matt, but I'm curious, like in New York, when you said they were taking everybody, was there like a line out the recruiting door? Cause that usually never happens. <laughs> yeah, no, it never, never happens. No, it was pretty, it was pretty quick. And also to, I think then, um, Fort Hamilton, Brooklyn is like, I think it's the number one MEPS on the East Coast, like the amount of people cross through there. So everything in the world, you know, everything was there and moved pretty quickly. But, um, but uh, you know, it's funny though, it was like, I was basically training. It was like, you know, everybody's like, guys are going to Afghanistan, you know, Ranger, you know, the Rangers were freaking deploying everything, you know, and like <clears throat> some of the drill sergeants I had, I had one that was like in Somalia, all different, you know, like it was, it was definitely a, uh, insane time in my life like it was you know this is this is what's going to be like guys and it's going to be for real you know all right so you said you kind of were fast tracking through uh the recruiting process headed right to benning um and then what's next um i i get to my uh duty station i got to fort stewart i got there i actually got there a little late uh april 4th of uh 2005 uh three sorry okay so i pretty much got there seen that the invasion for iraq kicked off was it March 19th? Yep. So like my brigade, I was in first brigade. They were already there. Yeah. They crossed over the right. border and everything. So I, I actually went to Iraq as a, um, what do you call it? Um, like a, like a filler in unit, uh, for guys that were getting hurt and wounded. So I actually, I went to Kuwait staged and I was in, ba I landed at Baghdad airport, like freshly taken over April 15th. I think my, um, my, actually my company battalion took the airport like April 4th. So I like landed there, uh -huh. I picked us up in Humvees and then they just, they brought us right into my, um, right to my company to fill in for, you know, guys that were hurt. So like the guys I went with, like one guy went to, you know, first platoon, one guy went to second platoon, two guys went to third platoon, like just went down the line. People that got killed, wounded and, um, serious, you know, had family problems and had to fly back. Was there a moment for you where you're sitting there going, how the hell did I end up here? Like just looking around like, you know, <clears> six <throat> months ago I was on Long Island and now I'm sitting here in the middle of Kuwait, you know, waiting to get on a, a bus to Baghdad. 
yeah, it, it was pretty wild. It um quick story actually like going into Baghdad, our C one thirty took ground fire. Mm-hmm. So I remember them specifically telling us um we left from the Kuwaiti airport and as so we get to the C one thirties, you know, we load up the Air Force had pallets with our equipment, we load up, we start flying, and I remember them telling us like two hours, it's gonna take us about two hours to get to Baghdad. So and it's you know, it's so loud in the back of the C one thirty. So I'm sitting there and um, I wake up from my nap and the plane's like descending. I look at my watch and it's like an hour. I'm like, what do we get there? Like an hour early. And the Air Force uh, crewman in the back and you could barely hear anything. They start putting like this Kevlar Velcro padding on the door and they start like putting uh, backing up against the door. And I'm like, I yell at them and like half half the guys on the plane, uh, plane are all passed out. I'm like, what's going on? And they're like, we're taking fire from the ground. <laughs> now the C-130 starts dipping and going back and forth. And I'm like, what? Like, you know, taking ground from fire. What is that? Is that small arms fire? Is it like, a, you know, some rusty anti-aircraft gun? Who knows? So the anyway, the plane balances itself out. That's all over. And then we end up landing. And then, like, it was a joke later on. They're like, hey, you know, they were shooting at the plane when we were freaking flying over there. It's like, it's funny. Like, the truck leader came out. So the, the the plane spirals in. We land at freshly occupied uh, Baghdad Airport. As the C-130 comes to a screech and halt, they're like, listen, a forklift's going to come. We're going to take your equipment off. You guys, single file line, get the fuck off the um, the runway. We've been taking sniper fire and mortar fire from, like, you know, different insurgents in the area and stuff. So back of the C-130 opens up, pallet takes it. We single file out. So we get off the tarmac. We're off the side. And it was like, it was like apocalypse now. We're sitting there and I I, I swear like 20 Blackhawks like flew past. So as I'm, as I'm sitting there, I look, I'm just like, you know, in awe of this this war movie that's happening <laughs> in real time. Mm-hmm. And large explosion blows up into the runway. So I look over there. I'm like, what the fuck is that? I'm like, yo, is that the engineers blowing stuff? I'm like, nah, nah, it's mortars coming in. I'm like, ah, this is real. <laughs> yeah. It's funny. I mean, when I landed in Baghdad, we also took fire. And uh, for those who aren't military – when you talk about the plane spiraling, they do one of two things to sort of uh, avoid fire. They corkscrew landing. So basically circle their way down, which is nauseating as hell. Like if you've got a oh. weak stomach, you're coming out of that thing green. So you're basically just like going around in a circle, like corkscrew pasta, you know, all the way down yeah. to the ground. And the other thing they do is they swing back and forth like the pirate ship, you know, like the pendulum. They just wade back and forth trying to avoid gunfire, which is also nauseating as well. So uh, um, it's just fun times on your way into Baghdad back in the day. All right, so you, you get on ground there. You finally get your bearings about it. When you get to your unit, what's the first thing you're told? Like, the, you know, you don't know anybody. Obviously, you're just brand new to the entire unit uh, and brand new to Iraq. So what, what are they telling you immediately off the bat? So um, there was, a, like, the guys I, I, I jumped in with were, some, like, a lot of the guys I was with, you know, on the plane going over there had different experiences. Um, some of the, you know, some of the platoons, you know, because these guys just crossed over and went through the shit and friggin' lost a couple of guys. And they did the Thunder Run. You know, they just took the airport, you know, like, so they were pretty, you know, grizzled out and like, who the fuck are you kind of guys? My platoon was aces. Like they, they took me in. They're like, oh, you're going to, you're going to do this, this and that. And, um, you know, I just fell into, you know, fell into rank with them and, um, you know, did a couple missions. You know, a lot of it was like when I went there in 03, well, like the shock and awe really did work. Like mm-hmm. the Iraqis, the Iraqis and the opposition, like the, you know, Fedeens and the insurgents that were all there, they really didn't know what was going on. And they were really, really terrified of the Americans. Like they didn't, like when I left in September with them, they just started getting their act together. They just started figuring out how, like, oh, we could do IEDs. This is how we could kill the Americans. This is how we could do ambushes, you know, get through the light skinned Humvees. Like, so when I was there, like, there was a couple skirmishes in 03. But, like, the opposition really didn't have their game together. To that end, you know, that first uh, combat experience for you, uh, what do you remember about it? What was it like? Um, I mean, it was it was a taste of what, like, my second deployment was like, the, like, the end of the world, like, <laughs> like, the real deal, blood and guts, like, close quarter engagements, all that crap. And so, like, it was a taste. So pretty much, like, I got this – I was in Iraq for a couple months, got a taste of what it was going to be. Went back to, 2000, you know, 2004, we trained up for the next deployment. And then, OI, you know, OIF3 was when I, I went to deploy to Samara, and that was, like, that was the real deal. Yeah. And um, That's when that I was there. Up. 
Yeah, oh, that was <laughs> that was a mess. Well, all everything in 05 and 06 was le- was the height of the insurgency, which led to the surge yeah. in 07. You know, I mean, historically, and we mention it all the time, but that's how it went. 05 and 06 was the height of the violence. It was when the elections were going on uh, yep. in Iraq. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, uh, it was when uh, Muqtada al-Sadr was at his peak, just blowing up everything, everywhere. It didn't matter who it was, whether they're Muslims or not. So it was it was pure chaos. And uh, that's what eventually led to the surge that that you know kind of quelled all that. But um, before we get to the second deployment, when you get back um, mm-hmm. from the first one, and I, you know I don't, I don't want to speed up too much, but yeah. it's one of those things where it's like, do you do you take a mental inventory of everything you just went through, and um, are you thinking that you you still made the right decision? Are you happy with the decision that you made? I mean, what are your thoughts after all that? No, ab- absolutely. You know, absolutely. And the, the one thing, too, like that first appointment, I was introduced to some amazing people that would I would train with and they would guide me through getting ready for the next deployment. And then we'd go back at it again for season two, you know, like and, um, you know, it, it was good. It was good to, you know, get that get the feel and see what was going on. But, um, you know, I it was definitely I, I was definitely ready for the for the next round. On that first deployment, did you guys sustain any casualties that you knew? My my platoon was the only one that didn't have anybody uh, seriously wounded or killed. The other platoons had people that unfortunately got killed. Do you remember like those those circumstances and everything? And, and what what did it do to you? It, it was you know even in the, like in the in the same and actually too in the second deployment we were the only platoon that had nobody seriously wounded or or killed. It was it was every everybody that that you know lost their life in my, like my company, my battalion, it was always like the next block over, you know, I was very fortunate not to have to, uh, you know, experience that. But I, I I remember like two of my friends getting killed, you know, the second deployment. And it was pretty much like I was sleeping and they woke me up like, you know, Klein so-and-so's dead. And I remember rolling back over to sleep and then waking up, like thinking it was a dream. And it was, you know, it was not a dream, you know, but, um, you know, when you when you go through the train up again and you say you were ready for the second one, what made you feel so ready? Yeah, um, we we actually did a rotation. It was like we did like a rotation and a half at NTC in the I think it was June of two thousand four, and all the all the cadre that were explaining to us were all Afghan Afghanistan veterans, and they were telling us like you know this is how to do things, this is that, and everybody like everybody I was with were all. Operation Iraqi Freedom Veterans, and they were all kind of like, eh, "That's not really how it works," you know. Well, yeah, well at that time, they were, to... they were definitively two different combat zones. I mean, they still are two, two different, different combat zones, zones but you but... know, the, the <clears throat> tactics and techniques in Iraq, uh, which is more of um, you know urban warfare and urban terrain, yeah, um, versus you know the mountains of Afghanistan are completely different. So, like, you're going with. So, I was going back there with guys that knew what you know what they were doing. Like that was another note too. Like my leadership staff like from like my lieutenant my platoon guy yeah everything on point platoon sergeant was like friggin the man like everybody my squad leaders my team leaders every i was very very fortunate you know i've seen some you know you see bad leadership ever in every aspect of life but i was rocking and rolling with some great you know sergeants ncos and my lieutenants were amazing you know at any point um do you start to feel like you know, on that first deployment after you get out of it and, and you're relatively unscathed. But do you, yeah. do you ever f- have that trepidation that, you know, you're going to lose your life at any point? No, um, no, not, not until my, my second deployment I had a couple close calls. So then like towards the end of the deployment, you're just like, all right, now, you know, I just want to make it out of here. But the first deployment, really, none of that. All right. So let's get to that second deployment. Um, when do you get there? When do you arrive? Where are you going? What's your mission set? Okay. So we get briefed pretty like the, the city we went to was Samara. So like the, the little backstory of Samara was in, um, first infantry division. They, um, they, they drove through there like one time, like early in, um, 2004. And, um, every time they went to the city, they were just met with a lot of resistance and insurgents and, tra- um, ambushes. And, um, they got tired of it. So they're like, cause you know, every time they left, they'd go back to the FOB forward observation base. They would, you know, they would set up all the traps and everything. And so that in October of 2004, they're like, we're going to do a mini Fallujah. We're going to go in there and just take the city. And we're going to, you know, set up a strong point and do patrols and operations out of the city. And that would be a finger in the eye of the insurgency. 
because um you know because we'll constantly be there like there's nothing they can do we can watch all their movements and track everything so 2000 um october of 2004 they did operation baton rouge i think they killed like 150 insurgents they went in there just like destroyed half the city and um they set up a patrol base called patrol base uvani it was named after i believe a pennsylvania infantry national guard guy that got killed in the uh, in little invasion so they fortified this schoolhouse sandbagged it everything put bunkers you know fighting positions they had the Bradleys there and stuff, and um, they just did operations there, just constantly just engaging the insurgency, going out and fighting them and stuff. So we got told all about all this, and we were going to take control of the, this uh, patrol base in January. So we left, I think, I think we left like the last week of December. We went to Kuwait, and then uh, mid-January, we, were, we, were, we met up with first, uh, I think it was 126 Black Spades and... Um, we met up with them. We started doing like right seat ride and just started, uh, fell into and started doing operations, combat operations uh, for the year. And for those who don't know, Samara is uh, a city right on the Tigris River, about halfway between Baghdad and Tikrit. And for reference, Tikrit is where uh, Saddam Hussein was found. So, um, you know, it's, uh, I'd say about an hour, an hour and a half, maybe north of, of Baghdad. Uh, so just for reference point. All right. Uh, as operations kick off, do you find, I know you said that the, the, the enemy had sort of gotten their tactics and techniques better by the second time around, but are you finding that the, I guess the fortitude of the enemy is more, it's not just pop, pop and run. It's they're willing to stay and fight, so to speak. Yeah, they had, um, they, 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 they pretty, orga- they organized themselves up pretty well. And like, you could, like, um, uh, you could tell that they were, um, I'm trying to think of a way to say this. They just had like, they they were on their game. You know, they had, you know, they were able to, you know, make contacts, set up ambushes, you know, do, do a lot of varying things. And they knew how, you know, they were blending in with the, uh, the populace very well. And they had, they had caches set up and, you know, that will play into another story later on, but they had caches set up in spots where they knew the Americans wouldn't go. And um, they really had a good system going. So tell me about a time on that second deployment where you were in contact with the enemy and sort of how it all played out. Okay. This was like, this is like, like one of the moments where I was like the most scared, even like getting, like when I walked up on an IED, like took me by surprise. This one like really gnawed at me. So what we did was the way we really crushed the insurgency over there is we did little kill teams everywhere. So at night we'd sneak it out on foot from the patrol base, walk out into the city, find, and the, the CO would give us a location where we had overwatch, you know, uh, traffic circles, places that the insurgents were just nonstop IED. And we just sit there and overwatch it. And like, you know, sometimes it was hours, sometimes it was days, but then guys would roll up on the locations, set IEDs up, you know, we'd call in QRF to have them on the edge just in case they escape. And then we, you know, we'd get up and, uh, you know, take them out and kill them. And, And like that, like really depleted them. Like the insurgents didn't know how to deal with that. So one day, this is November 4th, 2005. This is, this is towards the end of deployment. So it's like, all right, we got enough war stories now. It's getting, it's getting pretty crazy. So they drop us in. <clears throat> so they drop us in a four-man team. So it's my squad leader, my team leader, and my buddy. He's a saw gunner and then I'm a marksman. So I have my rifle. So we find that we have one traffic circle. And um, it's, I forget what it was. I think it was 40th and Laker Street. So we, we, we find this nice building. We go up to the third floor, and um, the family's very nice. A lot of kids, a lot of young kids and stuff, very receptacle, receptable to us. We um, we mount up there. So we're up there, and it's, it's, it's a little chilly, man. It's November and stuff. So we get there probably about, I don't know, like 4 in the morning. And then we go up there, and we begin our, you know, just watching out. So right now we have two people up. We have this rooftop, I would say, about 20-foot square. Then there's a, a stairs going down to a landing with a door and um we have one guy watching that and then one guy on the radio and the other guys you know passed out so we got you know half up security so we're just watching the traffic circle so this goes on for like i don't know a couple hours so so then now it's i forget like like 10 o'clock and i'm looking at the traffic circle and all of a sudden i hear ak fire on the street below behind me a bunch of rounds crack off I'm like oh shit so i everybody you know jumps up like what's going on what's going on so i grab my rifle i walk up to the uh ledge 
looking at the back street, my squad leader pops up and there's a car, <clears throat> there's what do you call it, a white truck and a car behind it. The car's got all the doors open up and all these civilians have their hands out. And there's two guys with AK 47s in plain clothes drawn down on them. So to go back in time, actually at this time in the city, there's like a tribe war going on. There's like two tribes fighting each other. One tribe, the Americans kind of support. And the other tribe is like completely with the insurgents, has car bomb factories in throughout the city. So like they're like the, the bad guys. So we just see these two guys with AKs aiming and screaming at these people. My squad leader snaps around off. As soon as he does that, two guys swing around, start looking at me. I just start engaging. Boom, 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 just firing away. So these guys are running from left to right to get back to the truck, and I'm just trying to kill them, trying to kill them as fast as, you know, hit them. And these guys are just whipping, running right through my bullets, man. I'm leading them as best I can. Miss, 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 miss. They jump into the car, the truck. I start blasting through the, wind, the window. I shoot the back windshield out, start shooting through the doors, hitting them up. The car screeches off. I'm just continuing firing. So from them um, swinging around to them jumping in the car and then driving off into cover, I, you know, I dumped the magazine. So I go, <clears throat> so I go over the radio. My buddy jumps up, starts shooting. I jump, um, jump on the radio. I'm like, yo, we're, you know, this is uh, Blue 5 Romeo. We're taking heavy, uh, you know, we got two guys here. We just engaged them. They're driving a white truck. The right back windshield shot out. Back, they're possibly wounded. And the, the right side of the car has got bullet holes in it. So quickly, you hear the QRFs on the radio, the platoons in the area. They start driving around looking, looking for the guys. During this fight, during the shootout, a kid that lived in the house got hit with a stray round. So the whole family runs out to grab him. And so my squad leader and um, my buddy go down there to give him aid. He, he took like a bullet wound to the top of the head. He was all right, but he had like a grazing wound over the top of his head. So it's just me and the, me and the team leader up on the roof by ourselves. So all of a sudden, <clears throat> you hear AK fire and rounds start cooking in into our position. So the rounds start cooking through the fucking, uh, the walls that we had, the little cement walls and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, yo, I go, sorry for done. You know where that's fucking coming from? He's like, I have no fucking clue. So I peek my head up a little bit and there's like a little mosque on the corner, like a little, little small one. And I think that's where they're coming from. So I put my head down to grab the radio. I put my head back up, more rounds start cooking in. So I'm like, fuck. So I call QRF up. I'm like, the guy, yeah, the, the platoon sergeant uh, was a friggin' the tenth mountain uh, Mogadishu veteran, awesome guy. He he picks up the he picks up. Do you the remember radio his name, by like, the way? Um, he's a I, I think he might, he's a sergeant major now, sergeant major Hunt. Okay, I'm trying to remember his first name. I was awesome just, uh, guy. We've interviewed a whole bunch of Black Hawk Down guys, so I was just awesome curious. Awesome guy. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like flashback to the middle, you know, like going through basic trade and stuff. Like my idols, man. Those are like freaking star football players. All those guys. Gotcha amazing dudes so anyway i go on the radio i'm like yo we're taking heavy fire you know this is where i fucked up i tell him i tell him what did i tell him i told him i am northeast of the tra traffic circle when i was really northwest of the traffic circle so they so they're like okay so they're coming to the wrong location so now i try to peek up to get a shot at this freaking mosque that's like down the street a little bit and they just keep shooting rounds in. I'm like, what the fuck? So I can't even get my head up. And the uh, same thing with the team leader. So all of a sudden I hear on the radio, gunfire stops. The radio says, Sergeant Hunt, is, he's at the traffic circle. And he's like, where the fuck are you, bro? He's like, I don't see you. I'm like, yo, I'm in the top building, the tallest building, you know, to your right. He's like, I still don't see you. I don't see you. And the gunfire stopped. Uh, the enemy gunfire has stopped by now. So I'm like, you can't see it? He's like, no. He's like, yo, do me a favor. He's like, jump up and wave, <laughs> and then I'll see where you are. I'm like, all right, fuck it, you know? So uh, That seems like a bad idea, just for the record. Yeah, that's right. So I, I jump up, I wave, I jump back down on the radio. I'm like, did you see me? He's like, no. <laughs> He's like, try it again. I'm like, all right. So I jump up again, start waving. They start shooting at me again. <laughs> so I'm like, fuck. I'm like, so I look at my sergeant. I'm like, sorry, we're done. You got a fucking two, you got a star cluster? He's like, yeah, 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 I do. He had, he had the, the flare for the 203. Right. So he puts it in. Me and him are back to back. Beautiful blue sky. Beautiful blue sky. Quiet. He fucking shoots it right in the sky and just goes on forever. I'm like, it's a fucking dud. It goes off. Yo, I saw the star cluster. I'm coming to you right now. So the fucking Bradleys come down the street. They're looking around. And um, they're like, yo, we don't see anything. 
we're gonna go, you know, we're gonna go fucking, um, we're gonna just keep patrolling on the area. If you need us, call us right back. We're gonna, we're trying to look for that white truck that you guys shot the fuck up. No problem. So they roll the fuck out. So I'm sitting there like, what the hell? So <laughs> the squad leader and the team and my my buddy, my battle buddy with the saw, come running upstairs and like, yo, we administered aid to the kid. Yo, he, I'm like, he took a nice wound to the top of the head, but he's gonna be all right. He's like, what the fuck is going up here? We're like, we're taking fire, I think, from that mosque over there. You know, I don't know what's going on. So the CEO goes over the radio. He's like, yeah, just maintain, you know, 100% security. Stay vigilant. We're in the area. Let us know if anything happens. Like, all right, whatever. So now we're all like, what the fuck, man? Like, yo, everybody in the world knows we're here now, you know? So we're just waiting. I'm waiting for an RPG. So everybody, we're just kind of like waiting and waiting to see what goes on. And we're, we're a little angry now. We're like, yo, why can't we just get pulled out of here like, and get set up somewhere else, you know? Because we were the tallest, tallest building in the, in the whole freaking block. So we're sitting there for about like, I don't know, like 10 minutes or so. And back where they, I initially engaged the guys at the white truck, you hear um, a car screech. <laughs> Doors opening up. <laughs> so I, I had my rifle, walk right back over to the ledge. Me and my squad leader look over. Five dudes dump out of this car, unloading AK-47 rounds. Fucking these rounds start cooking through the walls. Dude, I almost get hit. Like over my right shoulder, round fucking comes right over. Dude, these guys fucking like online, all five dudes start charging the building. So I fucking drop back, jump up. My squad leader is the man. He fucking shoots the first guy dead in the chest, fucking drops him. As soon as he drops him, the four guys like stop. Two guys run south on the road. The other one guy runs behind uh, the car they just got out of. And one guy starts running north, like spraying over his shoulder, trying to get away. My buddy with the saw starts engaging the two guys running south. He, 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 they, he, they never get hit. They freaking end up disappearing. I start engaging the guy behind the truck. And uh, my team leader engages and kills the guy that's running north. He hits the ground. He's trying to get away. And he fucking he finishes him off. So this is at a range of like, I don't know, 75 meters. It's crazy. So anyway, so I'm engaging. So there's a dead guy in the street. Right in front of us, one guy, a little north of the street, and then there's the, the gun battle going behind the guy in the car. So he's shooting, I'm shooting at him, and it's just nonstop, just going back and forth, back and forth. The guy dips, I lose sight. So I'm looking, I'm looking, I can't see him. The guy makes a run off the back of the car. Courtyard, there's a, there's a, um, a what do you call it, a house with a blue door. Court, he opens up the door, dives in there. My squad leader shoots the door three times. We go over the radio again. I, I'm like, yo, this is Blue 5 Romeo. You know, I got the platoon, so... so Second, second platoon comes flying back. Boom. So they come pulling up. And um, what do you call it? There's two dead Iraqis in the street. Oh, before this, too, they, we, we, I, told, I told my team leader, I'm like, oh, shoot a grenade in there, shoot a grenade in there. But there was like kids in the courtyard that right. the insurgent guy ran into. Mm -hmm. So we're like, yo, there's a guy in there. He's fucking in there. He's fucking in there. So the ramp drops. They all jump out. A bunch of my buddies from second platoon get out. They all stack on the door. They kick the door and they walk right in, pull the guy out dead. My squad, my squad leader shot through the gate, hit this guy in the head and the neck. Wow. Fucking amazing. Dude, done. Blew his fucking brains out. They end up fucking, um, you know, drags him right out. So, we got three. So, everybody shows up. Racky, you know, Racky Army, the rest of the, the company, the fucking CEO. The CEO's like, hey, you want to re-up? I'm like, yeah, I'm good, sir. I'm like, and at that time, <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I'm good. So he was like, yo, you sound a little nervous on the radio. I'm like, hey, sir, look at the wall. Yo, you looked at the wall and there's like fucking 40 AK rounds all over it. Like, <laughs> it went right through it. So in our battalion, if you did something really cool, you got a belt buckle. So I was like, hey, sir, when am I going to get that belt buckle? He's like, all right. <laughs> so they end, up, they end up bagging all the bodies. They actually got the two guys I shot up at the local. There was only one hospital. So they got the hospital. They got the car. So one guy I shot three times, one guy I shot six times. So, and they they definitely got hit through the car. So they end up they end up one they one guy was in critical condition. They actually medic vac him to Camp Spiker and did surgery on him and saved him. And then they ended up turning wow. him into uh, Abu Ghraib. So, mm -hmm. so but at the end of that, the CEO was like, "All right, <laughs> we're, you guys just hang out here for like a, another three hours." And they took the bodies and they freaking left. And we stayed there for another three hours until we got extracted. Wow. The whole time I was like, damn, man, everybody really knows we're here. <laughs> He's trying to use us for bait. I'm trying to draw more guys out and stuff. <laughs> did you end up getting your belt buckle? Yeah, I got my belt buckle. Yep. The whole cool. team did. 
my squ- my squad leader <laughs> hit the dude through the gate. So and then yeah, you know, and I have photos of all of it too. So, oh really? Like how close they were and everything. Yeah, I had like a little disposable camera and I was like took all the little pictures. But uh, awesome. yeah, that was a close one. The thing, like, I still, I still don't know to this day, is if they thought we were Americans or if we were the, the, the another tribe, the other tribe that was fighting against them. Right. So, did he get on the phone and be like, "Yo, you know, these those dudes just lit us up," and then they sent their posse over there, and then the Americans were there, you know? Gotcha. But um, but yeah, that was that was close. That was almost took a header like several times. <laughs> what What happened when you stepped on the IED? Okay, so that so that was back in um, April 9th of two thousand five. So there's there was a lot of rules in place when we first got there, and like you know it was all by the you know leadership like what would they do. So like there was a cemetery, and they said that um what do you call it? Uh, they were hiding IEDs in there because it was a religious spot, so we weren't nobody was going in there. So my CEO was like, screw that, they're definitely hiding shit in there. Let's go in there. So we had a whole plan. We we're going to do a, like a sweep in there with metal detectors and try to find it. So we went, my whole platoon went. So and it was in a bad part of the neighborhood. So as we go, um, we dismount, get out the Bradleys. I was just, you know, randomly point man. So, so I saw walking through and like, when you walk, when we walk in there, you know, fucking assholes are tight. Everybody's like on their point, like, mm-hmm. like wait, you know, waiting for it. And, it, and you, you've seen Iraqi cemeteries. They're all like very shallow. So it's a lot of bumps. For where the grave sites are so we're moving through real tight formation you know like really just being on point and um we go through the cemetery we don't find anything so i look at my lieutenant like yo time to mount up <laughs> and the lieutenant's like yeah, yeah, yeah let's, let's get the fuck out of here so we start to walk out and the, the cemetery was like a giant l so my my squad makes the left the other squad goes straight and hops a wall to exit the cemetery so, you know, you're on, I was on my game going in. I was a little, little, little more lax on the way out. So I'm walking. I didn't have my sunglasses that day. And thank God I had my SXX goggles on. I'm starting to walk. And I could see my Bradley on the side of the wall. And I could see this red door. So as I'm walking, I'm looking at my feet. Next thing I know, the entire world fucking explodes. Fucking the entire ground comes flying up. I go flying about four feet in the air. Hit my back. My rifle goes flying. I had my shotgun on my back. I hit my I hit my back, and the first thing I think is it's a it's an ambush, and that they're going to start engaging us from the rooftops into the cemetery. So I grab my, I crawl. I felt like a kid that fell off his bike. I was like, ah. <laughs> and I rolled over, rolled over a grave. I quickly checked to make sure I was okay. I look down at my my chest, and I have skin and blood all over it, and. My left ear is ringing, but my right ear is dead silent. So I'm like, they, they blew my fucking ear off. I reach over. My ear is still there. I just got blood on it. I roll over. I hear my lieutenant. He's like, Klein, you okay? <laughs> I'm like, I got blown up, sir. He's like, don't fucking move. Okay. Medic, this guy, 19-year-old guy, Delgado, fucking runs over, grabs me, drags me out. I'm looking at the clear blue sky, and everyone's just looking down at me. I was just covered in, covered in blood. The hole was six and a half feet wide by uh, three and a half feet deep it was just buried too deep so i just took shrapnel to like the side of my face my That's neck real yo no i i, I believe in god who's like oh it's not your time today to climb <laughs> like, yeah there's and, some uh, of that man <laughs> yeah it was yeah i was real close man like i should have so they bandaged me up everybody starts smashing through houses trying to find where the detonator guy is and um they bring me into a house and like once I knew I was okay, I was like, when I was wrapped up, I was like, all right. They took me in the house to make me take all my my uh, vest and my shirt off and make sure I didn't have any puncture wounds I didn't know about. So they start smashing and looking through houses. So bringing back to the beginning of the story, the gunner of the Bradley I was in, he said when we dismounted, you know, we went to the cemetery. He was like watching. He was up in the turret. A, um, a group of kids came over and started asking for candy. So they started giving them candy. Then an older Iraqi male came over and started yelling at the kids, like, get away from the Americans. So then my buddy said a couple choice words to him, and the guy came, dirty look, and just walked off into an abandoned building that was three stories tall, overlooking exactly where I got blown up. So when the second squad came out, he's like, yo, check that building, check that building. They ended up getting the guy upstairs. So he tried to jump out the window. They tackled him, and then he threw something out the window, and they got it. It was a car garage door opener. So... They're like, Klein. So they had this guy. I turned the corner and I hear like, 
Klein, come over here. This is guard the guy that tried to kill you. And I'm like, so I'll, I sat in the back of the Bradley with this guy that tried to kill me. It's insane. Insane. <laughs> oh, wow. The, um, <laughs> crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know. Let me ask you, like, were you angry? Yeah. You know what it is? I just looked at him like, I'm sitting there all bandaged up like a Q-tip, you know, just wrappings all over my face and stuff. And that he was shaking all over the place. And I was like, my ex-wife at the time was pregnant. So I was like, you trying to stop me from seeing my baby? And he's like, baby, baby. And that, you know, that obviously set me off. But it was, uh, it was really surreal, you know? Like, you're sitting there right there with the guy that freaking just tried to take you out. That's insane. So, man. Flash forward, the next day, they brought the engineers in. There was an immense cachet. So as soon as you walked in the gate of the, the cemetery, directly to the right, like right against the wall, was a huge cachet of weapons buried. They had to evacuate that part of the cemetery three times because it was booby-trapped up. They ended up getting it all out, and they found a mausoleum. They put all the munitions in there, and they blew it up. They had RPGs, mortars. They had one one five rounds. They had everything. Thank God that IED didn't set that off. It would have killed my. It would killed half my freaking platoon. You know, I would have blown blown a nice piece of the city street up. You know, yeah, but it's one um, of those times for as uh, innovative as uh, the terrorists can be, at times they miss some steps that uh, end up being fortuitous for us. That was crazy. It was crazy. So he must have like, oh shit, the Americans are here. And friggin' got in position and just waited for us to walk out. And then, you know, you know, thank God his timing was uh, shitty. But uh, <laughs> You mentioned before that your CEO had asked you if you wanted to re-enlist. At this point, do you feel like, okay, I'm done with this? Well, actually, going back, yeah, the reason why is because when I got back from Iraq the first time, one of my Army buddies just plays into my future. It was like, hey, they're giving the NYPD test at the officers club at – um. The, um, you know, whatever tonight. And I was kind of like, eh, whatever, whatever, I'll take it when I get out. And he's like, no, no, let's go. And he forced me to go. And I took it. So I got the grades back. And they're like, you know, we have your grades. When you get out of the military, you know, we can start your investigation. You just need a letter signed from your CO to defer you. So I had that all done prior to go, you know, going the over second the second time. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah, right. so I was like, if that didn't work, 100%, if that didn't work out, I wouldn't run it back into the military. Gotcha. All right, so... Um, this is 2005 when all this happens. Uh, when do you get back from Iraq and what's next? And how does your active duty career finish up? So it, yeah, it, it pretty, it went really fast and pretty seamless. So like we wrap up in Iraq, we finish operations there. We, um, we get back to, I get it back from Iraq, like the first week of January. And, um, my ETS day was April 4th. So I had a lot of, that was in that period, there was stop loss. So I had a lot of friends that just reenlisted because they were getting their ETS dates were like October, November, December of 06. So they were going to get sucked into another deployment no matter what. So that's why I was like, I have the good test. I have this opportunity. Let me, let me take it because I have the chance. So I got out. I literally got out of the army April 4th. It was on the, on the I-95 driving back up to New York. I called the uh, NYPD and I was like, Hey, I'm, I just got out. And they're like, all right, let's start your investigation. They started it. Three months later, I was in the police academy. Wow. So it's like you go from, <laughs> uh, you, go from you know, fighting, fighting the fight. And then next thing you know, you're like, you know, you're standing what's, uh, there. What's harder, police stand- academy training or basic training? I'm not going to comment on that. <laughs> 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 different, different animals, different animals. No, sure. So, they, they are. But- um but what's but, um, what's, it, what's more ahead. mentally challenging? What what challenged you more from a mental standpoint? Um, the mil- the military experience. Did? Okay. Yeah. The um. How much did the just, military just, prepare you for the police force? I absolutely like honestly, I completely happy I had the military experience. That's just for me personally. It could be totally different for other people, obviously. But like me, I just thought I had such more more of an edge having that military experience, especially that combat. Everybody wants to kill you kind of experience sure. that I think helped, helped me when I went, you know, when I was a cop on the street, you know, doing midnights, going into, you know, up into the projects and, you know, different da- dangerous situations. Just having that military experience, I, I felt a lot more. Hey, everybody, just a quick pause from the podcast to give you a word about my friends at my front page story. Look, Father's Day is coming up in a couple of weeks. And if your dad is anything like mine, your dad loves the newspaper. I think everybody's dad loves the newspaper. Well, give him the cover story he deserves for being such an awesome dad at MyFrontPageStory.com. Guys, I did this for my mother on Mother's Day, and I can tell you she was so emotionally moved by what My Front Page Story does. It is the absolute perfect gift for Father's Day as well. 
Telling your dad you had a story written about him as a gift for Father's Day is pretty much the coolest thing you can tell someone when giving a gift. Watching him read it and trying not to get choked up, just like my mom did, will be even better. What happens is you'll talk to a writer for about 10 minutes about your dad, and they'll write an amazing story about him and send it to you, and he will love it. I guarantee you it is an absolute win of a gift. So instead of going the old route for Father's Day, you know, socks, a tie, a gift card, give him something that he'll actually remember forever and go to MyFrontPageStory.com and be sure to use the promo code HazardGround20. Once again, MyFrontPageStory.com and the promo code HazardGround20 to set up an interview today to tell the story about your dad on Father's Day. MyFrontPageStory.com and the promo code HazardGround20. Now back to this week's episode. Can you, you know. can you think of a time where, you know, as a police officer, uh, an interaction slash altercation that you had sort of, you know, you got, the, you got a real chance to draw off that experience from Iraq? Oh, absolutely. I mean, like, my, the, the number one thing is, like, you go into a lot of people's houses, like on patrol, like domestics and stuff, and just knowing how to clear, you, you know, is – you know, all the different, you know, mountain urban operations and clearing rooms and this, you know, you know, point, uh, you know, what is it? Position of least resistance and you know, danger space and closets and all this, all that. Cause that, you know, that's in Iraq. That's all we did. Yeah. You know, going in that put your head and shoulders. Like I gave you a well, real advanced curve. And, and to this day, I mean, you know, whenever I walk into a room I've never been in, the first thing I do, and it's a, it's habit now. I don't even think twice about it. But I scan the entire room for points of egress and entry, uh, danger spots, choke points, things of that. It, it just it, it's Absolutely. natural for me to walk into any room, especially when I do it like restaurants or public or anything else, or I'm walking around the mall. I'm always surveying. I always look at the land from a situation of if something bad happens, where do I go? That's predisposed in my mind that way. No, absolutely. Like sitting, you know, sit with your back against the wall, facing you know the entrance and so forth. You know, all different types of stuff. But um, I'm glad I had that experience. You know? So you end up spending uh, you know, over a decade um, in the NYPD sort of as a, for lack of a better term, a beat guy, right? I mean, is that yeah. essentially mm-hmm. what you did, just doing the, doing the, uh, the street work? Um, yep. Let me ask you, I, I've said this repeatedly, and uh, because you're still on the force, I understand that you may need to be diplomatic about this. But um, I've always said that a cop's job is much harder than the military. I used to be friends with a cop when I was living in Baltimore, you know, after I got back from my first deployment and we would just kind of chat back and forth at the gym and uh, he would be, he would tell him, man, Hey, thank you so much. You know, I can't believe you did that. And I'm like, bro, your job is a thousand times harder than mine is. My decision to shoot is a lot easier than yours is. You know, I pull the trigger yeah, in combat. I, I don't really have much to worry about. Every time you go out on the street, you have to worry about when you take your gun out of your holster, if your ass is going to be the one on the line. So is there some of that for you as a cop? No, absolutely. You know, and also t- you're, you're dealing with, you know, you're dealing with Americans, you right, know, like sure, you're dealing yeah. with citizens like you and me and like family, you know, like, so there's a d- different, you know, but all, you know, the dangers are all there. You know, some, you know, people, you know, you experience it in combat. People will look at you, smile and try to kill you in a second, you know, mm-hmm. and there's, um, there's a lot of violent encounters and there's a lot of encounters that, um, to me, like, like in Iraq and stuff, like when you actually get into a, when you actually get into a firefight, when the firefight actually hooks off. All right, cool, rocking and rolling the training. You're like, I go here, I go do this. All right, I'm jumping the cover, reload my magazine. Like everything starts to fall. The initial jump is like the scariest part, especially if it's you. You know, there's a difference between your platoon getting shot at, your squad getting shot at, or you getting shot at. And for you know, being a police officer, you know, you you know, two people in a room. And the guy, you know, tries to pull on you or something like that. You know, that's uh, it's definitely a, a lot, yeah. and a lot of officers experience it. You know, every day, unfortunately. Were you closer to dying in Iraq or closer to dying as a cop? Iraq, okay, by far. All right, Iraq. Yeah, said, yeah. I mean, listen, <laughs> you guys are getting some hairy stuff. So, I mean, it's no, uh, there, no, the yeah, the possibility and um, the, the possi- and also the chances for complacency as a police officer are a lot higher. Why, why opinion, do you think that is? Because it's like, you know, you're going to 7-Eleven to get a coffee, you know? Do you want a Danish today? you want a bagel? Oh, no, something just popped off. You know, like, it's more, <laughs> it's, it's not like, you know, I remember my first deployment in, in Iraq. I had, like, the Black Hawk Down soundtrack just 
in my head <laughs> right <laughs> playing over like it was a different world you know like knew it but like you know i, I guess the, the only reason i asked that question and it, it, the answer seems obvious when you say it but for those of us who have been there you know it's groundhog's day right you get to do the same thing over and over again and you sort of um understand the lay of the land so much better i, I would assume that in police work not every day is exactly the same, right? Because no, things, things are constantly. Nope. So to me, that seems like you would be more on your toes than, okay, well, I've patrolled this neighborhood for the last six days and nothing's happened. By day five and six, you're kind of like, you know, sort of letting your guard down a little bit just out of natural reaction. Whereas in the police force, Absolutely. again, I think I think with everything changes day to day, you're more on your toes, but obviously you, you feel otherwise. Yeah, no, it, no it's because you're, it's your, your home, you know? You're, sure, you're, yeah. you're working with it. You know, 30 minutes, you're like, oh, it's Friday night. I got two hours left. Then I rack. You're not like, oh, two hours, I'm going to go hit the bar up. You know, like two hours, I'm gonna, like, you know, like you're there. Where, that, you know, that was just my experience with sure. it. Sure. All right. So you end up uh, transitioning from a, you know, street cop, a beat cop, to a forensic sketch artist. Uh, <laughs> I'm curious, I'm curious <laughs> how you told your supervisors, hey, I, I can draw. I like to draw. Like, how does that conversation go? Well, I, gi- I give a lot of credit to my father. He was a amazing artist. He was actually an animator, worked for Warner Brothers and Disney, and like just drew professionally. But like growing up, it was always like feast and famine. So I was kind of like, this is not like I don't think this is the career choice for me. But I always drew. Like I continued to draw. Like I did it in high school, in the military, I was drawing, and then and uh, when I joined the police department, I was drawing and um, drawing, drawing. So I ended up doing um when my army buddy from Iraq, he, um, we did an interview with Tom Brokaw and, um, he interviewed us for American movie classics, like heroes weekend. He just had to tell us, you know, sto- some stories about us over there. And, um, I got to meet a guy who knew about the sketch artist unit and I never heard of it. He's like, Oh, my friend, he's a first grade detective. He got, you know, you should meet him. And, um, if they ever have an opening, you should take the test. So I inquired about it. I went down and I talked to him, this guy, detective Perez, awesome artist. And, um, I showed him a portfolio and he's like, all right, that's cool. So I took the drawing test and he's like, wow, man, you got a lot of talent. So they did a, a lot of talking was done. And like, Yo, you know, we want you for the spot. Unfortunately, you just got to wait for me to retire. And this is in 2011. So he didn't retire until the end of 14, 2014. And then they, they picked me up in the, um, uh, January 15. And that's where, I, that's where I started doing all that. All right. I, I tell you, the guy <laughs> is a guy, he's six, two brown hair, you know, a uh, muscular guy, you know, a hard draw line, sort of bushy eyebrows. Uh, his nose is a little bit crooked. Like, is that the information you need to start drawing? Or how do you uh, transition yeah, no, words uh, into visual? Well, the main thing we do is uh, the composite sketches, like what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. There's like, there's a couple steps. The first one is we just, we interview the person and we get an idea of what the guy looks like. So exactly what you just said. So I get like a mental image of what the guy looks like. Then we have old photos, mugshots from the 70s and 80s are so definitely not him. And um, based on age and race. So if you're like, you know, it's a male, white, 20 to 25. So we pull those out. You go through the photos. You pick like different features. Like, oh, I like this guy's nose. Why do you like this guy's nose? Oh, it's crooked. He's like, what, what, I like these eyes. I like these lips. So they pick out features. Along with that interview, you take those features and you draw a face in private. You reveal it to the victim. They t- and you get like a reaction and sometimes like it's on the money. Sometimes they're like, oh, you know, oh, that looks like him, but you got to ch- just make his eyebrows a little thicker and this and that. You go back and forth with the, with the victim to find out, get the closest you can to it. Then we put it in the computer and then it's released and then it helps, you know, helps the detectives on the grounds, you know, solve it, the various the different cases and stuff. It's impressive. Um, how satisfying is this work for you? I mean, it just seems like, you know, after all these years of running and gunning and police forcing <laughs> and everything else, um, you know, not that this is a hobby per se, but I mean, it, it's just like one of those things where it pretty, it's, it's a pretty big, you know, dichotomy from what you were doing to what you are doing. Yeah, it's, you know what it is? It's like, it's a, it's a, it's a nice chapter, you know, and it's something different. And the one thing that's nice is it's a talent I had. That, I, that was always in my back pocket. And like, what was I ever going to do with it? Who knows? Was it just going to be a hobby for myself? But now I got in, in, into a position where I can use it to help people. And um, it's that's really gratifying, you know, it, and it's different. And also too, like the whole military background really 
really put me, you know, forefront, and, you know, when there's a selection process for this unit. So, you know, people are very respectful of it. The NYPD is very accommodating for military and take good care of their uh, their veterans and their people that are still actively in the guard and reserves. But, um, you know, it's a very gratifying altogether. How long do you want to do this for? How long can you do it for? I could, I could, I could finish out my career doing it. So I, I, unless, you know, unless I, something else comes along that I'm interested in or if I, you know, but, uh, it looks like I'm going to stay there for quite a bit. <laughs> how, I, I guess we talked in the beginning about, you know, how few of the, their sketch artists there are left. How do you, how, how do you guys sort of keep that industry or that line of work open with, with technology being the constant, you know, enemy of what you actually do? Um, you know, technology doesn't always work, you know, then yeah, there's, there's, you know, shortcomings to it. Not all the time, but there is, you know, I've, I've had cases, I've had complete, I had a robbery once that was in front of a security camera store and like with like a couple, you know, hundred security cameras in the front w- uh, window, none of them are on, <laughs> you know, and so they had to bring her in to get a, get a drawing done. You know, it's, you're, you're always going to need that, you know, you're always going to need it. What? I mean, the numbers will be down, but uh, you know. It's still going to be work there for it. What's it like to hear a, a somebody who you have to draw, you know, a victim who you have to draw a, a suspect for, tell you like, you know, that's exactly what it looks like. I'm able to identify the guy because of what you did. Oh, it, it's it's completely gratifying. Because you know, also too, like, you know, I could draw the best picture in the world, but you have, you know, like it does, it won't look like him. You really have to listen to the person. So like when you see that, it's just, it's a melding of both, you know, both worlds. And it's, that's like great. I've had, you know, I've dealt with some horrible cases, you know, rape, sexual assaults, you know, homicides, all different types of crazy stuff. And to, you know, to bring, you know, any, some type of, a little bit of closure, you know, one step closer to getting the guy is uh, really gratifying. I mean, I'm curious as to what the sort of, for lack of a better term, the operational tempo of your job is. Are you just sort of like sitting at your desk doodling, waiting for the phone to go and, hey, Klein, we need some, we, that, we need to sit here and draw something. That's it. Really? That's, that's it? it. Oh, okay. All right. That's it. Like I was actually, I was taking a college class and um, this was like two years ago and um, I didn't have any college. So I was taking, um, using the GI Bill and taking some classes and I was actually in an art class and I, you know, I don't tell, I didn't tell anybody who I was and stuff. So the teacher was talking to me and then I had. My phone goes off. I look down at it, and it's like, "Yo, we can you leave class now?" We have a, like it was a horrific um, homicide. It was a, a dis- dismembered woman. Can you? We need to go to the uh, Kings County morgue, and you got to draw this person. So I look up at the I look up at the teacher, and the teacher's like, "I'm like, yo, I'm so sorry." I looked at my phone. You know, no, no disrespect or anything. I'm actually an NYPD detective sketch artist. Can I leave early? I have a homicide. I have to go work on it. She just looked at me. <laughs> she looked at me like, "What?" Her jaws on the floor. <laughs> she was like, "She's like, what?" Yeah, she's like, "Tomorrow in class, you have to tell me." Everything about this, I'm like, no problem, miss. I'm like, I'm leaving. <laughs> I freaking jumped in my car, off to the off to the morgue. I went, you know. That's how. But that's exactly how it is. There's okay. a couple. There's a couple cases like that where you just get the, you know, it's a quiet night, and boom, you get a phone call. It's like there was. Um, I did a case with two Saudi Arabian sisters. They committed suicide in the in the river, and it was like a big deal. They thought it was a, you know a gang murder, this and that. But it was like you need to come down here like now asap. Boom, out the door. Next thing you know, I do. When can the drawing be done by 11 o'clock? Boom, it's on the news. You know, then they make identifications and the, you know, later down the road, case gets solved. But, um, you know, that's how it is. Is it hard to draw under a time constraint? Um, I, you know, in the beginning it was, but like, you know, as any job, like as you go, it gets better and better. Like now I have a whole system in my head, you know, relax, get myself a drink, sit down, you know, get, you know, and just start rocking and rolling. And then sometimes there's cases where, you do a drawing and it never gets released. Like they solve it, you know, and the, and the, you know, the, the 20, 24th hour of the, of the day, you know, it's like, Oh, we don't need it anymore. And the drawing never gets seen ever, but you know, you have to do it because they need it. Do That's you, another thing too. Do but, you save all the drawings that you make? Oh, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Interesting. They're so you have like there. this book of creepy dudes. I keep absolutely. saying dudes because I don't know how many <laughs> women you've had to draw as criminals, but you have, you have a, you have a sketchbook of creepy dudes sitting in your house. Not in my house, in my office. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> That would freak me the hell so, out. And I have like, you know, I have like the side, and like all the good ones I have like side by sides. You can see what they look like. And it's crazy. Like they all have stories. Like I, I speak at, um, we have the, the NYPD does different classes for, the, you know, detectives and stuff. So I go and I go there and I, you know, I do a lecture on it. And I really don't have to like have too much 
in my PowerPoints, like the drawing, you have the, each drawing has a story all on its own. You know, it just goes on and on and on. All so interesting, all different. If I went into this sketchbook and pulled out a photo, could you tell me about the case based off the photo? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Oh, I want to do that so bad. Just, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty. It's, it's a little creepy, right? They all they all have a story, you know. I, I really it's just like, want to sit there over a beer with you and just sit there and say, "All right, <laughs> this guy, who is he?" There's some wild stories too. Some of them are just like, Ooh. "That's insanity." Tell me about Battle Tribe. So, so anyway, I like I I'm into like I do a lot of like movie, sci-fi, military art, very like high, high octane stuff, and it was always like something I did on the side, and um. One of my friends is like, you know, you really got to put this on Instagram. It's a good social media platform. You could get it out there to, you know, people to see it. And I'm like, all right. So I started, I started doing it and um, people just started catching on to it. And I had a friend, I did one, I did one funny picture. It was a bunch of special forces guys with stormtrooper helmets. I, I think I I'm, like, I'm on your Instagram now. I'm looking at it. <laughs> it's funny. I was like, oh, let me, so let me put that out there. So one of my friends is like, yo, this is a really cool, you should put this on a t-shirt and what do you call it? Um, let me, do you mind if I put it on Reddit? I'm like, yeah, no problem. So he called me back the next day. He's like, dude, 64,000 people liked it in like 24 <laughs> hours. So I was like, whoa. <laughs> so, so I was like, oh, this is great. So, so I just started, you know, just kept trugging along and just, just constantly and just drawing all different types of stuff. And then people just, I just a real group, uh, got a group of like a nice, just, uh, I guess like fan base of people that are just really into it. So I just started doing, you know, and like, I just want to get my art out there. So I think, I think that's like the coolest thing, just making it accessible for everybody. And stickers was like uh, just an um, easy way. And like instantly people, they put it on their gun cases. They put it on their, their uh, water bottles. They put them on their cars. They put them on their skydiving helmets, surfboards, everything in those boats I've had people put. So like it's just an explosion and it just keeps going and going and growing momentum. So, and I just came up with a name, I, you know, I put together as like battle tribe. I think that sounds cool. We're very like, Everybody's kind of tribal as as a as a natural element. So, I, and that that was it. So I just keep doing that. And like the one thing is great is everybody gets to see this stuff. And I've made I've talked to so many and met so many great people, such as yourself, through it. You know, there's a lot of cool stories. I met a lot of really cool people through my artwork. That's that's incredible. And it's Matt Render R E N D A R on Instagram. Yep. Uh, go check it out. I just uh, as I'm scrolling through it here, it's pretty awesome stuff. Has anybody ever commissioned you f- to do anything for them? Yeah, you know, like right now, I'm like really, like really swamped. But um, yeah, I've done commissions. I've done um, I've done a lot of artwork for um, different companies, different brands. A lot of co- a lot of cool friendships. Done some collab collabs with different military companies and stuff. So I'm re- I, I I love the whole veteran artist aspect. You yeah, know, there's a lot of there's some veterans out there that are just amazing artists, and not even just like hand drawn like. Like uh, you interviewed Brad Thomas, mm-hmm. another Long awesome Island guy. guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got to meet him. Awesome guy. You know, and he's a Mogadishu guy. So yep. instantly, I'm a fan, fan, fan girl. <laughs> the um, but I did artwork for his, you know, for his band. Silent and Light. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Awesome, awesome guys. And um, I've done. Uh, there's a couple other brands. There's an airborne brand, Wetsu. Uh, there's a machine gun, Marine Corps, Goons Up. I've done artwork for them. There's a British company, uh, Red Coat Apparel. I've done artwork for them. So I was actually uh, terminating lame. Um, you're familiar with the um, the uh, Nairobi Kenyan SAS operative uh, story? Uh, you mean the embassy in Nairobi? Um, no. In, in, what do you call it? Back in um, January of last year. In Kenya, there was a lone, um, there was a terrorist attack. Five, I think it was Boko Haram insurgents uh, infiltrated. They went into a shopping mall. One detonated himself with a suicide vest. The other broke off into two man teams. They started running around killing civilians. I think they killed like 24 people. Gotcha. And there was a lone SAS guy that was stationed there training the locals. He jumped into action in his jeans and his uh, t shirt and his uh, <laughs> vest and his M4 and went in there and friggin' pulled people out. It's an awesome story. So wow. I, I was like, I have to draw this guy. So I drew him, put it up there, everything, and, and getting in contact with him. And awesome, awesome guy. But that was like, you know, a connection I would have never, ever made, you know, if I, if I didn't have my art up on Instagram. It's very cool. Amazing, amazing stuff. Again, Battle Tribe and on uh, Instagram, Matt Render, R-E-N-D-A-R. All right. Well, what's next, man? I mean, like, just keep drawing and just keep having fun. I mean. <laughs> yeah, that that's it, you know. You know, obviously, right now we're dealing with the uh, the coronavirus. 
you know, in uh, New York City is getting hit pretty hard. So yeah. no, you know, no coronavirus kinda, art for you. No, 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 okay. no, no, no. I did, I did one, <laughs> one coronavirus monster, like before it got serious. But uh, that's it. <laughs> but um, yeah, that's it. You know, just hunkering down through that, and hopefully when this is subsides a bit more stuff but i'm just you know there's so much more stuff i want to do more military art a lot of the art too i have there's like little little nods of different things i experienced you know over there and stuff and um like you know like a lot of my artwork is kind of visceral a little violent but um but yeah that, that's it man just more cool stuff and it, it's just it's really nice to see that everybody enjoys it uh, you know outstanding and, and, man so uh, I just I'm looking through and I love it. It looks it, it's great stuff. I'm yeah, sure you've seen your old uh, your old drawings from 2003, the rough sketch meant for a never yeah. done mural. It, like I mean that's yeah that's outstanding yeah. stuff right there, brother. Thank yeah, thank you. There's no, nah, it was cool. There's cool stuff, you know. Well, listen, man, you, you keep fighting the good fight uh, and drawing the good draw, so to speak. Uh, you know, and <laughs> certainly thank you for for all your time. It's been great talking to you. Absolutely. I appreciate your honesty, brother, and uh, you stay safe up there and. Uh, certainly thank you for being part of the hazard ground i appreciate it thank you so much have a good one you've been listening to the hazard ground podcast hosted by mark zeno and produced by matt pascarella if you have an interesting story to tell and you'd like to be on the show send us an email at hazardgroundpodcast at gmail.com and if you like the show don't forget to subscribe rate and review on itunes thanks for listening we'll see you next time